Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our MPC Online Bible Study. Uh, my name is Matthew McGlade. I'm the lead and teaching pastor here at Mansfield Pentecostal Church. And every Tuesday night, we have our regular Bible study where we have a thought to think about, a, a, a question to ponder, and a text to study. And I hope you get something out of this. Again, I just remind you, uh, use this teaching session to discuss the questions amongst yourselves, uh, study the scriptures together, and you get much more out of our time together. Now, we are going to tonight finish off our, our teaching series that we've been looking at over the last few weeks titled Emmanuel, God with us. And you remember we've been looking at this incredible truth, this teaching that God came into this world to redeem humanity back to himself in the person of Jesus. And you'll remember that the teaching of the incarnation is what it's called, is, as I mentioned before, the teaching that God came into this world in human form. Now, given this, that God came into this world in human form, it's perfectly natural for our own minds to sort of be confounded and even just hard to grasp this concept, this idea of, you know, how can how can that this come about? You know, how can God come into this world in human form? How can he take on a human nature? You know, if Jesus was God in human flesh, you know, how can he be all powerful and at the same time weak? You know, how can he leave this world and yet be in this world at the same time and be everywhere at the same time? You know, how can he be someone who learns and at the same time know everything that there is? And so there's often, for many years, especially in the, the history of the early church, there was a real struggle grasping this reality that Jesus was God and man in one person. And so for hundreds of years, as I mentioned, the church wrestled with Jesus' divine and human nature. Some people thought that maybe uh, Jesus had a human body, as, as far as his body goes, it was human, but maybe his mind and his spirit was divine. But we see examples in the New Testament, don't we, where Jesus was surprised and he, you know, he, he maybe asked questions. So, so that clearly doesn't work. And then it was thought that maybe Jesus was two persons. Maybe he was a God person and a human person. Uh, and, but clearly it's very it's evident, isn't it, that Jesus didn't have a sort of a split personality. He was one person uh, and we see that throughout throughout the scriptures. Uh, some thought that maybe Jesus was partially God and partially man, a bit like, you know, you add water to cordial, you get a mixture uh, of, of the two aspects of his divine nature and his, and his human nature. But it's very clear throughout the New Testament, the apostles clearly taught that Jesus was fully God and also fully man. And so these controversies for hundreds of years were wrestled with within the church. And eventually, it, the, the church eventually came to a definition in the, in the year, uh, in the year four, about 450 AD, where they came to an understanding of the identity and the nature of who Christ is in a town called Chalcedon, just outside modern day Istanbul. And they came up with the definition that we've been using over these last few weeks to describe this truth that God came into this world. That Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man in one person and will forever be so. Now in this final session, as we look at this teaching of Emmanuel, God with us, we're going to look at this, the last aspect of this definition of Jesus, that Jesus is one person, even though he is fully God and fully man. And this understanding of Jesus' uh, um, nature helps us to resolve uh, a few of the issues that we see throughout the New Testament. Firstly, this definition of Jesus shows us that one nature of him does something that the other nature does not. Think for a moment of Jesus' presence, both as being fully man and fully God. Luke rec records that when Jesus instructed his disciples to, uh, to wait for the coming spirit, that after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. 
showing that as far as his, his humanity was concerned, he can only be in one place at any given moment in time. And yet, at the same time, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus records that for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am with them. It seems that Jesus can be uh, at one place and at the same time, everywhere at the same time. And so his divine nature can do something that his human nature can't do and vice versa. What about Jesus' age? How old is Jesus? Well, according to Luke, Luke records that Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. Now, we accept that Jesus was born into this world and, you know, somewhere in the year eight, you know, uh, 4 BC or somewhere around there. Uh, and that Jesus as a human being has been living since then. Then he's over 2000 years old as a human being. And yet at the same time, Jesus said this. Uh, and uh, during his earthly life, he said that very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. And so again, we see one aspect of his human nature that is time bound. But we also see an aspect of his divine nature that is timeless and eternal. What about his power? As a man, Jesus experienced the physical limitations and the human limitations that we all experience in our own humanity. John records that at Jacob's well, uh, that, that John records that Jacob's well was there in the town of Samaria, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. And yet at the same time, Matthew also records in his gospel uh, that when Jesus was with the disciples in the storm, that he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. Tired and yet all-powerful. Asleep and yet sovereign over all of creation. Or what about his relationship to death? As a man, Luke records that Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. But as God, Jesus could say that no one takes it, my life, from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. Now, if we think of death as being a separation of our, our, our spirit from our body, then as a man and as humanity, Jesus experienced death. He understood what it was to go through death when he his body was when his spirit was separated from his from his body. But if we think of death in terms of ceasing to exist, of no longer being here, then it is impossible for Jesus to die because Jesus is God. Jesus is divine. And so in each of these examples, we see that one aspect of Jesus' nature can do something that the other aspect of his nature can't. And so the truth of the statement that Jesus is fully God and fully man in one person holds. And that's quite remarkable when you think about it because as a man, Jesus tasted death on our behalf. But as God, he has overcome death. He has the final victory over death. But this definition of Jesus' nature also explains something else about Jesus, and that is this, that anything that either nature does, the person of Christ does. Jesus, as a person could say, before Abraham was born, I am, even though as a man, we know that's not possible. You know, he is free to talk of anything that he does in his divine nature and his human nature as if he himself personally did, that, did it. Now, let's give an example of this. Imagine uh, you've been asked to type a letter. Uh, you know, when you uh, type a letter, you use your fingers. That's the part of your body that you use. And you do not use your toes, okay? Uh, unless you're a very talented person. Well, the, the truth is this. If you were to say that I typed a letter, you don't say my fingers typed a letter. You say I typed 
the letter. Because what is true to see that one part of you did is also true to see that you did personally. And the same is true of Christ. What he did in his divine nature or his human nature, Jesus did personally. And thus the truth that Christ died for our sins, even though it was only his human nature that, that died and his divine nature that did not die, it is still nevertheless true that Christ as a person died for our sin, which simply affirms that whatever can be said of one aspect of Jesus' nature can be said of his whole person. Okay, and which is why it's also correct for Jesus to say, I am leaving the world, and yet at the same time, I am always with you, because Christ as a person is, is doing that, even though one aspect of his nature may be fulfilling, fulfilling that. And so as far as his human nature is concerned, um, or as his, his divine nature is concerned, we can say it is true that Christ as a person fulfilled. And so finally, the, the truth of the statement that Jesus is fully God and fully man in one person can also explain why titles that remind us of one nature of Christ can be used of the person of Christ. You know, when speaking of the person of Christ, the New Testament often uses titles that either refer to Jesus as divine nature or his human nature. And it's, that title is used in a way that is a describing of the other nature. Let, let me give an example of this. Okay, For example, Paul says that if the rulers of the world had understood what they were doing, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now clearly that title, the Lord of glory, is a title referring to Jesus' divine nature. And yet Paul is using that to describe Jesus' humanity when he died. Or take, for example, Elizabeth's description of, of, of Mary uh, when she says that the mother of my Lord, clearly her title of my Lord is describing again Jesus' divine nature, but it's used of Mary being the mother of Jesus as a baby, as a child. Or again, when Jesus says, but about that day or hour, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but, uh, no, so, uh, but of that day or hour, no one knows, speaking of his coming, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now the term Jesus describes himself as the Son is a title of his divine nature, but he's also clearly speaking of himself in human terms, that he didn't know the time of his coming. And so, this truth that Jesus is fully God and fully man in one person and will forever be so provides for us the best explanation of the mysteries that we see throughout the New Testament. And you know, it took the church nearly 500 years to try and figure this one out. And so if we were to summarize the incarnation of God coming into this world, we would simply teach, summarize it that Remaining as he was, as God, he became what he was not. In other words, while Jesus continued remaining fully divine, he also became what he previously was not, fully human. He did not give up his deity to become a man, but he did, but he, but he did take up a humanity that was not previously there before. And, uh, you know, this, I know this teaching tonight has been quite deep. I, I, I accept that. But, you know, some have argued that the incarnation of Christ, of God coming into this world, is possibly one of the greatest miracles that this world has ever seen. Maybe even greater than the resurrection of Christ from the dead itself. That the infinite creator, uncre creator of the universe came into this world and has joined himself to a human nature so that the infinite God will become one with a finite man truly is one of the most profound miracles that we could possibly grasp. And it certainly is a mystery 
that, that you know, our minds sometimes just find it very hard to fully conceive or grasp. You know, I hope tonight that as we've just delved into this deep truth, and I know it's a deep truth tonight, but I hope that it's caused you to appreciate something of the magnitude and the greatness of who Jesus is and why Jesus is someone you can put your trust in, that he fully identifies of you as a human, but also at the same time, he is someone that you are to bow down to and worship as God, because that is who he is. And I hope that uh, tonight, as a result of the study, that actually you have gained a deeper assurance and a deeper confidence of you putting your trust in Jesus as your savior and as your deliverer. Well, that's the thought to think about. The question to ponder is this. Can you describe what Jesus' disciples must have felt as they came to a growing realization of who Jesus actually was? Can you describe what Jesus' disciples must have felt as they grew in a growing realization as to who Jesus actually was? And do you think Jesus is the one person you'll be able to trust your whole life with for eternity and why. And the, and the text is study. I'd like you to read Romans 1 verses 1 to 5. And from this text, in what ways does this reading sum up the truth that Jesus is fully divine and fully human in one person? Well, guys, thanks for dropping in our study tonight. Again, I hope you've got something out of this. Hope that it's edified you and encouraged you. You know, next week we're going to look at the importance of Jesus' death on the cross and the significance of that truth. And we're going to unpack that, that truth. So listen, I hope to see you next week. Hey, have a great rest of the evening and a great rest of the week. And don't forget to drop into our prayer meeting tonight. Drop me an email below and I'll send you the Zoom link. Hey, have a great rest of the day. God bless you all.